Hi, everybody. Judy, the YouTube lawyer here. Thanks for joining in today's show. We're going to be covering three different cases that have been in the news to varying degrees. Um, starting out with something that has been going on in my state, which is North Carolina, with the sad beating death of Shanquilla Robinson. So if you guys have been following that case, please feel free to put in your comments in the chat box. If anyone really wants to join me on the video, on the live stream, I'd welcome that also. And I can put a link in the chat box. So um, Shanquilla Robinson was a 25-year-old woman who was a uh, budding businesswoman. She was selling clothing in an online boutique, and she had a thriving hair business, hair braiding business. And she was also a student at Winston-Salem State University in North Carolina. When she went on a vacation with six of her so-called friends, but within 24 hours of her arrival, on this uh, vacation to a resort in Mexico, she was dead. So what happened here? It's just very, very disturbing. Um, just, of course, if you're watching this, if you are easily just uh, freaked out about these kinds of violent, traumatic types of events, then please don't continue to listen because, unfortunately, all three of these cases are just really awful to hear about. And so the stupid thing is that her so-called friends actually recorded most of the beating. Um, how ridiculous is that? At least uh, two of them, one was her so-called best friend, Khalil Cook. They're taking out their phones and recording this horrible, awful beating death where two different female friends were beating on her, slamming her on the floor, punching her really hard while she is not even fighting back. And in fact, her so-called best friend even is heard on the recording telling her to fight back. Like, why aren't you fighting back? Like, it's something fun. Um, very bizarre situation. Um, and thanks to these people's desire to record every second of their lives, uh, there was actually video footage, maybe on Instagram, where um, the friends were all eating together. It seemed like they were all having a really good time the Friday night before Shanquilla died. So um, just really, really awful situation here. And what's even worse is that there's no justice for her so far. And I don't have any easy answers to this, but the federal government has decided not to bring any charges against her friends. Um, the autopsy that was done in Charlotte uh, was inconclusive. So the medical examiner basically concluded that it was a unknown uh, cause of death. It's very, very bizarre. I'm not a trained medical examiner, obviously, but um, you know, it just seems really bizarre that um, the examiner would note all this blunt force trauma, you know, bleeding in her brain, uh, fractures, and ultimately conclude that uh, they don't know why she died. So that's going to definitely make it really hard to have a wrongful death suit. Um, so we can talk more about that later. Uh, in terms of a possible civil suit against some of these friends. So uh, let's look at the comments here. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys, for caring about this case. I've tried to cover other cases on this channel, and sometimes people just are totally interested in cases like the Dan Markell case, maybe a little bit the Robert Wan murder case, but... Um, you know, I try to cover some other cases also. So thank you for covering this. It's been on my heart since day one. We cannot just let it go. Yeah, I totally agree. That's why I still felt like doing another live stream show about this, even though there's really no new news lately, other than the sad news that there's not going to be any federal prosecution of her so-called friends. Yeah, 
thank you for being here from New Mexico. Hey, Debbie, thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, a lot of people really care about the Dan Markell case on this channel, but um, there's just so many horrible cases going on throughout our whole country. It's like, what is this world coming to? You can't even go on vacation with your friends and your so-called best friend without getting beaten to death. It wasn't even a fight. Um, in the video, which um, I haven't seen the whole thing because I think it would probably be a little bit too disturbing, but from what I heard, um, you know, like she wasn't fighting. It was not a fight. In fact, it seemed like she was uh, kind of sleepy or something. Like they said she was naked. Uh, she liked to sleep in the nude. So maybe her friends had actually pulled her out of bed to deliberately start beating up on her for fun, you know, so they could record it and put it on social media. And that's how they were found out because, uh, you know, her friends were stupid enough to circulate it. And, uh, of course, people were like, what are you doing? You know, this isn't right. I mean, at least some people have some morals here. Yeah. So thank you, Paper Thin. Yeah, Mexico is not the place to go these days. Yeah, totally. I mean, it was with her friends, but um, who knows whether you can actually be protected with the uh, um, corruption there. Yeah, thank you for being here, PB here. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for covering this important case. Very sad. Shanquella deserved better in life. Yeah. I mean, she seemed to have a really good start ahead of her. She was building up her business and everything. And, um, you know, her parents were devastated. Yeah. So her own so-called friends. Yeah. I was reading some more articles and it sounded like um, the main culprit is a woman whose name has already been out there all over the place. So I'll just go ahead and say her name is Dejanay Jackson. And according to an article I just read, it seems like they knew each other from going to college together at Winston-Salem State. So uh, they were all going down to celebrate because it was Dejanay's birthday. So that was the reason for the trip. I've also heard reports that um, Shanquella, being so successful with her businesses, she actually paid for some of their expenses or they took her money and used it even after she died, something to that effect. I mean, just really awful. And the male friend who was uh, recording the beating and kind of chiding her and telling her to get up and fight. So he... Um, yeah, he had been her so-called best friend for five years. He had gone on vacations with her and her family. Um, I've heard reports that he's gay. So, you know, it wasn't like a boyfriend type of situation, but he was very close to her family. And in fact, he was the one that talked with her mother, you know, told her about uh, Shanquella supposedly dying of alcohol poisoning and brought over her luggage to her mother's house. And uh, then, of course, he shut down as soon as the autopsy findings were revealed to the public. So he, he then disappeared. So I'm not sure where he is now, but um, these friends, so-called friends, are supposed to be somewhere around North Carolina. So, yeah, totally messed up. Yeah, it's a very bizarre situation here. I mean, if people think like, oh, you go on a vacation and maybe you get attacked by some strange criminals or something. But uh, these were people that she felt were friends to the point where they were all going on a big vacation to celebrate. So it's just really horrible situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um is the world more insane? Are we just hearing about these crazy murderers more because of social media? Um, hmm. I think the world is going more insane, but it's also both because normally these cases, you know, especially the attorney cases, I don't think people are really hearing about it here in the state where I am, which is North Carolina. Um, it's just because I seek it out where now you're on the internet, you can easily just type in Google and find all sorts of news about all sorts of different uh, horrible crimes, you know, things that happen to other lawyers in other states and stuff. So I think it's a little of both. So uh, who was hitting Shanquilla? Okay, so to the best of my knowledge, um, I don't want to 
be accused of making false allegations or whatever. Let me get some water. I'm sorry. My voice is going as usual. Just really tough to keep talking. To the best of my knowledge, I think that it was Dejeuner who was doing most of the beating. So, in fact, one of the articles that I was going to show, it has a tiny little clip of the beating inside the hotel room, where I'm pretty sure it's Dejeuner who's just whopping the heck out of her with fists, you know, like beating her down on the floor, you know, just like throwing her body around. It's just really awful. And there's also been allegations that another person named Winter Donovan was also hitting her too. But I think most of the stuff captured on video was uh, of Dejan Hay. So um, I don't know where these people are. I mean, you would think that it would be pretty easy to track them down if uh, they all knew each other, people knew, knew them in North Carolina, but, um, but they haven't even been charged. Doesn't look like they're going to be charged with anything. So it's really awful. Um, are we just more queer? Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's both that it's so easy to look up information now that, um, anything can become kind of an obsession if you're looking for different like crazy criminal cases or stories about people going down to Mexico and becoming victims of crime. You know, it's just a click away, things to Google. So yeah, jealousy. Yeah, that's what people have said that perhaps they were just jealous because Shankwella was successful and she was making good money. She's growing both of her businesses and stuff. So they just thought that it'd be funny to take her down a notch and just beat the crap out of her. So really awful. Uh, lots more suicides too. Yeah. Although these cases definitely are not suicide. Uh, although one of the turning cases, people at first, the authorities were claiming it was suicide. But uh, we'll talk about that more later. Okay, so this is the article about um, Shanquella Robinson, which I think is probably one of the better summaries of the case. Uh, who would have thought that Yahoo would still be relevant, right? But I found this really good article here uh, just from a few days ago. Uh, says two weeks after prosecutors announced they would not bring any charges in Robinson's death, her family is raising doubts about the U.S. investigation. Okay, so that's a picture of her with her mother and her sister there, off to the, uh, in the picture with her. Okay, so her family is raising doubts about the U.S. investigation. Um, her mother says it's very disturbing because they saw the same thing we saw on video. Um, they do an autopsy and come back with something different. I don't even know if I can trust them. So uh, that's a picture of her that's used in a lot of media coverage. And this is just a summary of it. But it's, it's just sad because in this Yahoo article, uh, they also quote some kind of experts about extradition. And they basically say that there's not much that can be done because the US doesn't have any obligation to extradite people to other countries. Um, because um, at least one culprit, most likely Dejane has been charged with murder in Mexico, though. So the U.S. doesn't necessarily have to help capture her and turn her over to the authorities. So, okay. Oh, gosh. Sorry about my voice as usual. I knew I shouldn't have eaten all that salty popcorn thing for this. Okay. So anyway, so just kind of sad news here, but I do want to draw attention to the Facebook group, which is, um, it's like a community, community group in Charlotte, which is organizing a march to DC to bring more attention and try to ask Joe Biden and try to draw attention to this case. Um, so in case anyone's interested, this is called the Million Youth March of Charlotte and Salisbury Teen Advisory Board. Okay, so I think for short, it's called like uh, MYMOC, uh, Facebook 
dot com slash m y m o c a s. So maybe I'll put that in the chat here. So they've basically been trying to get a group of people together to travel as a group to DC on May 9th uh, to try to draw attention to this case. And I think the group was going to all go together in the same buses and stay in the same hotel and stuff. But the deadline was maybe about a week or two ago. But if anybody wants to keep up with the latest news with this organization that um, I'm assuming they have connections or they're in touch with Shanquelet's parents and sister. And this is a group that is uh, organized by a man named uh, Mario Black. So uh, May 19th is going to be their big trip up to D.C. Okay. May 19th is the Justice for Shanquel in March. Okay, so I'll flash that up on the screen. That's the Facebook group. If you want to like it or join it or contact the person, and then May 19th is the big trip to D.C. to try to draw more attention to this. So, um, yeah, so that happened on October 29th last year. So these people that she went on the big trip to, they're all still going about free and joined her lives. Um, just thinking about whether it would be worthwhile to even file a civil lawsuit against them. That's like a totally different thing compared to whether um, somebody could be criminally charged with murder. And I mean, still, the, the huge barrier, I think, is the fact that um, the ultimately the autopsy was inconclusive. And that's just really sad because I'm just thinking from a lay person standpoint, since of course I'm not medically trained or anything. Um, I don't think they did the autopsy on her until three weeks after she died because first she was um, obviously in Mexico. They did the autopsy there and said her spine was fractured or something. But then, you know, after all the red tape and stuff, then her body was transported to Charlotte. And that's where the medical examiner basically said that the spine was not fractured, but there are all these other injuries to her and concluded they don't know what caused her death. So I think that really, really get in the way of having any sort of successful wrongful death civil lawsuit in this situation. Um, of course, the family could still sue the actual culprits, the people who actually beat her up um, for assault and battery, you know, for that, but uh, not wrongful death. And unfortunately, also her friends that just stood by cheering it on, um, maybe recording. Um, I'm not really sure if there's anything civilly that could really be done for that because uh, generally there's no duty to rescue people. Um, although I guess it could be alleged that they encouraged and incited the beating. Not really sure about that, but they do have an attorney who is representing them. Some somebody from Florida with the same last name, Robinson. Um, so that's just kind of interesting. I wonder how they got the attorney from Florida because uh, there's actually plenty of attorneys that I'm friends with that I know in Charlotte that are very experienced in these types of cases, but um, maybe they had a connection with this person in Florida who's representing them. So let's see. Um, I will take that off the screen. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at um, this article here, which has to do with um, her autopsy. Okay, so this is kind of graphic here. Um, there are no pictures, but I'm going to read some of the stuff. It says the new autopsy shows that her spine was not actually broken. It says, no skull fractures are present, no evidence of injury to the upper airway section, no hemorrhage in the surrounding neck muscle or fracture slash hemorrhage of the mid to lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebral column. Removal and sectioning of the organs revealed no evidence of other trauma. 
or disease process. No fractures of the ribs or the remainder of the vertebral column. Slight lateral scoliotic curvature is present in the upper to mid thoracic spine. No evidence of hemorrhage or disruption of any of the musculature, ligaments, or spinal elements. No fractures are seen on the posterior of the spinal column. No evidence of any disruption of the spinal column alignment or sub subluxation. Okay. Okay. Um, and they had a neuropathology consultation. Cause of death undetermined, but most significant findings were hematoma of the forehead, mild cerebral edema, concussion, hypoxic ischemic brain injury, which is inadequate blood flow slash, slash oxygenation of the brain. Um, hematoma of the forehead was consistent with blunt force trauma. So the U.S. attorney determined there is uh, not enough evidence to charge anyone. So, I mean, it just kind of goes against common sense, but, you know, it, just makes you have more questions to the medical examiner's office. Um, I mean, clearly you would assume that the feds, they know what they're doing. They know the standard of proof. Um, I guess there were still some, uh, there was a doctor in Mexico who had also examined her before she was pronounced dead and claimed that, you know, it looked like she was intoxicated. And that's what the friends kept telling the doctor who showed up in Mexico that um, she had been drinking a lot or whatever, but that's their side of the story. So yeah, it's just a really sad, awful situation here. Let me drink some more. Sorry again for my hoarse voice. A long day with work and stuff. Okay, so next really sad story here. Um, okay, we got to have some good news to report, right? Eventually, I think I, I'm going to do another funny video on Saturday and Friday. I'm also going to do something different and interview one of my friends who is a published author of a children's book. So, so totally different topics here, but um, let's take a look at um, Elliot Blair. Okay, so Elliot Blair was a 33-year-old public defender in Los Angeles, and his wife was also a public defender in Los Angeles. So for their honeymoon, they had gone to this uh, nice resort in, let's see, Rosarito. It was called the Las Rocas Resort and Spa. They went there on their honeymoon, so for their one-year anniversary, they decided they were going to go back there again to celebrate, and his wife's name is Kimberly Williams, but the sad thing is that he was actually found outside three floors below the hotel room um, with about 40 fractures to the back and the side of his head. There was um, severe bruising on his extremities. There was um, some sort of bad abrasion to his toe, signs that perhaps he had been dragged after being beaten somewhere. Um, this is where it gets a little weird, okay? So I don't want to get in trouble by, you know, saying anything wrong or whatever, but um, there have been some people making comments saying, how come the wife didn't know what was going on. She claims that um, the night before he was found dead, that they had gone out, um, been driving around somewhere uh, near the resort when some Mexican police officer pulled them over because they didn't fully stop at a stop sign. And the person was bullying them, trying to get money from them. And supposedly, Elliot um, said that they didn't have any money, that he was an attorney, and he showed his public defender badge, which seems a little weird, because why would being a public defender in Los Angeles really help you when you're in trouble with the police in Mexico? Okay, so according to the wife, they ultimately did pull out $160 in cash and gave it to the police officer. Um, so then they were left alone. Um, I think the news also said that Elliot was uh, fluent in Spanish, so he was able to speak with the police officer in Spanish, and that um, 
the officer had asked them who they were, where, where they were staying, something like that. So, um, okay, so wife says that Elliot had maybe five to six drinks that night, but um, she says that she had never seen him like totally drunk or whatever, and she fell asleep at 11.45 p.m. So it was several hours later that she was awakened by the hotel staff, you know, telling her that her husband was found, you know, outside um, with all his injuries. So this, uh, this article here, uh, it's from the New York Post, and I'll go ahead and put the URL out there just in case anybody wants to see it here. Okay, so interesting that there is some sort of surveillance video of him and his wife here dancing that night um, at the resort before he was found murdered. Okay, so there they are. There he is getting his groove on along with his wife, Kim. Okay, so they're just like celebrating their first anniversary. They met while they were both public defenders at the same office. And um, actually one of my recent guests, uh, Cyril Yu, who is a prosecutor down there, um, he said that he does know the wife and he did know Elliot also, but he didn't have any real inside scoop about what's going on with this whole investigation, because it just seems like the, the whole case has pretty much hit a dead end. Uh, the Mexican authorities just claimed that he had fallen from the balcony, and that uh, it could have been that he was, he was swatting at pigeons or something. I don't know. I mean, this is crazy. Like, how would anyone know if he was like falling off the balcony because he was swatting at pigeons on the on his hotel balcony? I think that's kind of silly. Um, he was found, he was found wearing his underwear and a sleeping t-shirt and socks. So that again, is kind of weird because if he had deliberately went outside the hotel room after his wife fell asleep, then he would definitely, you know, have some real pants on, right? So um, they have a lawyer who is working on the case. It says that um, his head was badly fractured, his body bruised as if he had been beaten by more than one person before his death. He was found face down outside his room at the resort on January 14th. Okay, so they had a second autopsy done in the U.S. that shows all those injuries on his skull. And um, let's see, okay, well, this article says second floor hotel room, but most of what I've read said it was a third floor hotel room. Okay, so the attorney says it's either he fell to his knees for some reason, or he got hit and dragged. One of our experts told us it's likely that more than one man did this if you look at the damage to Elliot's head. Okay, so that's one of his professional photos. Says he was a rising star in the Orange County Public Defender's Office before he was found dead at a Mexican resort on January 14th. Okay. So these are gruesome pictures. So you guys look away if you don't want to see them. It's kind of creepy, actually. But uh, it's in a New York Post of, of his legs. Okay. So I'm not really sure what else is going on in this case. And I, I do feel like something is a little weird here. I would like to hear more about the wife's side of the story. But yesterday I, I watched one of the little local news clips about the case where Kim is sitting next to her attorney talking about the case. And she actually laughed at one point, which I thought was really weird. You know, it seemed totally inappropriate when she was talking about her husband's death. So anyway, just something strange that I find of note. Um, I would definitely like to find out more information about, you know, what her side of the story was, you know, like, know he just fell asleep and uh what happened i guess that's that's her story it's that uh he he she has no clue because she was asleep right okay so let me see here oh okay hey tracy thank you for being here thanks for bringing attention to this okay it's so sad 
Seems like the media has dropped the coverage of this story. Okay, yeah, I think you're referring to the Shanquella Robinson case. Yeah, it's still it's still sort of a big deal because I'm here in North Carolina, but it does seem like um, it's more like the very local news stations around Charlotte that covered it. But um, there was some sort of Newsweek article that I saw online that was also pretty thorough in addition to the Yahoo News. So anyway, I'm glad to bring more attention to these cases. Not many people will know it. Okay. Oh, the comedy that I'm doing. Okay. I'm just doing some things here on this channel also to give us some smiles and take us away from all, all this gloom and doom of all these like depressing criminal stories. Yeah, why hard? Yeah, that's what that's what some people in the comments have also said, like, hmm, you know, like, did he have life insurance? Public defenders don't make much money, you know, could have been that uh, I've hired something because somebody, because she's the only one that, you know, can claim that they were stopped by a police officer uh, the night that, uh, you know, this happened. So um, who knows? Who knows? Well, I'll try to keep up, keep up with the news on this case if there's anything further. Lots of kidnappings in Mexico, not safe. Yeah, I mean, it sure seems like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Life insurance policy. That's what I'm not sure of. I'm not sure of yet. But, um, you know, from all the reports, his whole family is, like, totally devastated by this. In fact, his father, um, yeah, his father had died back in 2020. So his mother was all depressed already. And Elliot was the one that encouraged his mom to go join this uh, grief support group. So she had gone to the meeting that day before he was found dead. So that was described in the um, LA Times article here. Okay, so it says he was uh, remembered for his generosity. And that's his mother at the memorial service in California. This is from February. It says that Elliot loved to help people. He often stayed late at work to speak with his clients, people accused of crimes who could not afford to hire a lawyer. If he wasn't in trial, he was advocating for his clients, said Annie Rodriguez, a coworker and friend. Judges and attorneys would be wondering where he was, and he was just outside in the hallway talking to his clients, listening to them. Okay, so they gathered at a church in Garden Grove to celebrate his life. He was remembered as a person who was moved to act whenever someone needed help. Okay, so this is where they talk about how his father died in 2020 and his mother was still going through the grieving process. Okay, so anyway, really sad, bizarre case here. Um, this is where it says that he was found splayed on the floor, three floors below the couple's room in his underwear, sleeping t-shirt, and socks. Um, William said she didn't believe her husband's death was an accident. Someone did this to him, said Williams. Okay, this is where she talks about how they were stopped by the police who claimed the couple th drove through a stop sign. The officers asked for money. Okay, so this is from the... LA Times. Okay. Okay. So feel free to look more into that case if, if you guys are interested in Elliot Blair. Okay. Uh, okay. So Debbie says, I tell my son it isn't safe to be an attorney these days, a litigator for an insurance company against a client who knows what they can do to. Yeah. I mean, all this stuff lately in the news had has made me uh, as well as some of my attorney friends, a lot more cognizant about safety in the office. Um, in fact, we were supposed to have some sort of mediation in one of my cases, and the um, other attorney did not feel like it was going to be a good situation to be in the office with uh, one of the parties. So, um, yeah, you got to do what you can to protect yourself, and it's always better safe than sorry, right? Yeah, what would be the motive? Yeah, so that's that's what I don't know. I mean, we don't know if he had life insurance. You know, we don't know what's going on. You know, it's just kind of like a black hole of information. And plus, you know, it's also further compounded by the fact that he died in Mexico. So, um, 
you know, it's like, what else can be done? The family got their own autopsy done, but now what? You know, like the evidence is all in Mexico. So, uh, okay. So let's switch over since, uh, sorry, like I said, I shouldn't have eaten that salty popcorn right before I did a live stream. You live and learn. Okay. So this has to do with the attorney in Florida, Stephen Kazi, who was, uh, he's actually missing. They haven't even found his body, but he's presumed dead. And this doctor, Tomas, uh, what's his last name? Tomas Kosofsky, I think that's how you pronounce it, is already arrested and accused of murdering him. So poor Stephen. Let me tell you the little summary of his life. Um, Stephen seems to be a very well-liked, wonderful man who decided to go to law school as a second career. So he majored in, uh, in theater at Virginia Commonwealth University and graduated back in 2003. Then he worked on Broadway in New York City, working as a wardrobe tech for Broadway as well as off-Broadway productions. Um, sounded like he really enjoyed that, but uh, then he felt a calling to go to law school. So he went to Stetson University Law School in Florida and got his JD in 2016. And he was working at this firm called Blanchard Law Firm in Largo, Florida for about uh, four to five years before he disappeared and is presumed to have been murdered. Um, I saw on his LinkedIn that uh, his areas of law were bankruptcy, foreclosure, defense, debt settlement, and business and civil litigation. So the case he was dealing with was uh, this nutty plastic surgeon, Dr. Kozlowski, who um, was representing himself and he was all mad. It seems like he has some mental health issues or something. So he was suing his former co-workers, people at his former medical practice for billing issues and money that he felt he was still entitled to. And poor Stephen wound up having to be an attorney who took over this case defending the defendants. And uh, Tomas just had a huge grudge against him. This is what happens a lot because I've actually dealt with some cases where the other person is pro se and uh, attorneys usually hate those types of cases because a lot of times the pro se person is just kind of mentally off kilter, very stubborn. They have nothing to lose because they're not paying an attorney to defend them or to represent them through the proceedings. So they'll just do whatever they can to drive the other party crazy and run up costs and do things wrong, you know, screw up everything. It's, it's just kind of like a real mess when you have to deal with a pro se party, much less someone who has severe mental health issues like this doctor seems to have. So, um, okay, so what happened? Stephen was just working in his law office one day and in fact, on his computer, he still had some emails up, his wallet, his keys were still there on his desk when he got up and apparently went to the restroom and he never came back. So that day was March, 3rd, March 21st. Um, later, the surveillance camera showed that Tomas Kosovsky had actually gone in and out of the office building and they caught him on camera taking something big that seemed to have some red on it. Maybe, um, I think maybe Stephen was wearing a red shirt or red sweater that day. I'm not really sure. But um, it, it appeared to be a body that was like wrapped up in a rug or wrapped up in something. And he was pushing a cart, allegedly, um, out in the office building parking lot to his vehicle. So we still don't know what exactly happened to Stephen, but I think um, most people have concluded that uh, Tomas must have assaulted Stephen in the bathroom. In fact, there was some other time, maybe a few weeks before Stephen was missing, that um, someone saw Tomas just hiding in the office building, like behind a door somewhere, and thought it was really weird. And um, as soon as the other person saw him, Tomas you know, left without saying anything. So I had read that um, somewhere in an article there. 
Uh, so Tomas is 44 years old. He was a plastic surgeon. Um, I saw some pictures of his house. It was like a huge mansion with a beautiful swimming pool and everything. So you assume he had to be good to some extent as a surgeon, but uh, <coughs> it seems like he had a lot of problems dealing with people. So, so he's been arrested. He's in jail now. And of course, all his attorney can say is that, you know, everybody's presumed innocent, right? So, okay. So this article talks more about um, that day, what we do know about uh, what happened. Okay, so it's just very sad. Stephen was married. He was gay and had a husband who really loved him. So his uh, husband has been out on social media, or not social media, out in the media, just basically talking about what kind of person Stephen was and uh, how he would like his husband to be remembered. So really sad situation here. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, just want to bring some attention here to some cases that many people might not know as much about here. And uh, this is a, another article um, where his boss, Jake Blanchard, talked to the media about um, Stephen and what was going on with the case and th that last day that Stephen was seen at the office. Yeah. So Blanchard says, I thought it was odd that he had been gone for so long. He was preparing for a hearing. Uh, when Blanchard went to the restroom to look for him, he says he found blood and called police. Cause he has been missing ever since. Largo police made an arrest in his murder Sunday morning even though police say Kazi's body has not been found. According to Largo police, Tomas Kozowski, a pro se plaintiff in one of Kazi's cases, killed him. You don't know why somebody would hurt somebody as nice as this guy, Blanchard said. I mean, this is the nicest guy, the sweetest person. Okay, so that's a picture of him um, from his husband. His husband's name is Michael Montgomery. Okay, uh, Blanchard... Kazi's boss said when police asked if Kazi had any enemies, only one person came to mind. Five days later, that man, Kozowski, was arrested. This is the only person I could think of that had a problem with Steve, Blanchard said. Kozowski had grown increasingly irritated with Kazi over Kozowski's ongoing civil lawsuit against his former employer. Lawfer Institute of Plastic Surgery. Kozowski sued for breach of contract and misrepresentation over a billing dispute. Kazi represented several of the defendants, and Kozowski represented himself. Yeah, always just really awful and stressful when you have to deal with people who refuse to hire attorneys, or maybe they're so bonkers that no attorney would want to represent them. Yeah. So nobody expected violence. Yeah, there's some local Florida news channel that has been covering this case extensively. In fact, one of the newscasters was his friend in law school. So um, it's just another sad situation here where I felt that we need to draw some attention here. So um, let's see. Hi, Norla. Thanks for being there. <laughs> I think I should probably stop the live stream and get myself some hot water to drink. Sorry. Um, it's getting to the point where we all self-isolate and only trust animals to be who we think they are. Yeah. Well, I mean, in this case with, with Kazi, Stephen Kazi, I think it was pretty obvious early on that this guy was bonkers and he already had gotten in a verbal argument with Stephen um, during a deposition or something also at the same office, but um, who would have thought that the guy would actually, you know, assault him somehow and kill him and, you know, drag away the body. So we don't know where the body is. Um, the authorities obviously did search um, the doctor's mansion already. Um, they found blood evidence in his vehicle, but um, no body has been found. So let's hope that uh, Stephen Kazi will at least be found to give more closure to his husband and his family and friends. So, okay. Well, thank you guys for being here. I don't know if I should keep this live stream up or not since I sound so awful in it. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just glad that um, this is a avenue to get word out about uh, different 
interesting cases and and unsolved mysteries for people who care about these things and the victims and hope to bring justice for all of them. Uh, sadly, they are so abused these days. Okay, so okay. Well, I hope um, everybody has a much more uplifting evening. Let's all think that um, sometimes too much true crime is not really great for our mental health. So um, go out and do something that brings you some happiness and smiles. And I'll just be having a live stream on Friday night with one of my old friends from college who has written a children's book about um, being an immigrant from Taiwan. So that's totally different. But I wanted to help Jane promote her book. And I'm so proud of her being able to publish something. Um, then on Saturday, we were in the Donna Adelson situation in the murder of Dan Morkel. So I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>